Okay. This should be the 13th lecture of Wireless Without Batteries. Um, so, uh, the, what I was just talking with the students here in Shenzhen was the class assignment. Uh, we handed out the term project. Distance learning students will be doing the exact same term project as the in-class Atlanta students. So I'll go ahead and put this on uh, the website, on the T-Square website, so you can download it. I'll probably email it out as well. And the goal here is it's an individual project. You get to pick the topic as a student. There's a list of I example topics that is by no means exhaustive. You can propose your own topic. They're all related on variations of the uh, themes that we talked about in class. And I think the one thing that I want to stress is I'm not looking for a book report. There needs to be some uh, original investigation involved. You're not getting a thesis or a dissertation out of it, but you know, do look at an aspect that probably hasn't really been talked about much and, and pursue it. And I've got a bunch of examples there, and you're welcome to propose new ones too. March 15th is the date due date for your proposal. By proposal, I just mean send me a paragraph that tells me what you want to look at, which of these topics you're going to propose to look at, and maybe a, an example reference that you've read on that topic already, uh, just to show that you're heading in the right direction. And I'll give you feedback and authorize your, your topic. Uh, more than likely, I'll just say, yeah, that's a great idea. Here, why don't you look at these, these things? These will help you. Uh, I guess if, if it's kind of out of too far out of bounds, I'll say, well, go back to the drawing board. But I don't anticipate that happening. And so March 15th, that's two weeks from today, Wednesday, um, is when the proposal will be due. And then April the 24th, which should be a Monday, that's when the project will be due. Submitted electronically, six to eight page report in IEEE transactions format. That's two columns, single space. It's all written in the problem statement. Uh, I do have to mention too uh, that I've been experiencing delays in uploading the videos to the T-Square site. So it may take an extra day or two for some of these videos. Um, the uh, I think it's an export bandwidth issue that our building is experiencing during the course of the day. Uh, because I don't have this problem at night. For example, I'm, I've got about two past videos from various classes that I need to upload uh, right now, and I will, they'll probably work fine this afternoon, this evening, when I come back from my late night back to North America meetings. But uh, right now they're timing out and taking a long time. So just uh, apologies for any delays that that caused. I think this is the time of year where you want your lectures delayed as much as possible because we just keep piling it on as professors. Okay. Um, any other questions about the, the uh, project that you thought of or anything that I should mention for the sake of the distance learning students as well that would be helpful? No. Okay. Well, let's talk... Today, our topic that we're going to discuss is, we'll probably talk two, two topics. It's ways of making your modulated backscatter seem larger than it is. Uh, and both of these would make interesting topics for your paper report, for your term project. And we're going to first start by building what we talked about last Monday. On Monday, we talked about multi-antenna signaling. It was really a demonstration of how you can get multiple transmit antennas communicating To multiple reflection or tag-based antennas and sending information back 
to potentially multiple receiver antennas. And this is a very interesting topic of research. There are a lot of papers on this recently. And uh, I think for your next homework assignment, which may be your last homework assignment, because I've, I was reminded today by the students that I've uh, hit my contractual limit of five or six, whatever I promised in the uh, uh, syllabus, which is fine because I'd like to re cut back and, and let you guys work on the project once it's assigned anyway. But uh, there's a lot of interesting papers on this because you can do a lot of interesting things. You can modulate your transmit signal in a way that improves tag rec signal recovery. You can modulate your tags in a way with multiple antennas that improves signaling. And you can do a combination of the two. There's a lot of combinations, a lot of things that people haven't thought of. So I, know, I put that as one of the topics on uh, projects. If you were to just cons consider uh, a way to signal with backscatter using multiple antennas at either the transmitter or the receiver or the tag or both. So um, that was our, our general discussion. We talked about how to track signals in this type of physical scheme. What does a tag look like if it's using multiple antennas? It's got multiple load modulation. Sometimes you can even drive them independently of one another. There's benefits to not doing that. There's benefits to doing that. Um, and today, I wanted to talk about a special case of this that's actually really neat. And it's called retrodirectivity. And to understand the, the beauty and the value of retrodirectivity, I have to give you a little bit of background. Let's say I had an array of antennas. Of course, arrays are nice because I can phase them together. I can run them some, through some sort of phase shifter, for example. which if this is a receiver array, I can phase these together to maximize the signal to noise ratio in, a, in, a, in an uncluttered environment. If I were operating this in free space, that would have a nice analogy to beam steering, right? I can phase these antennas together in the array in such a way that they act like a single antenna with a significant amount of directionality. You know, maybe some gain in, in a particular direction where I'm expecting to receive signals. And any, anybody that's familiar with array theory knows that you kind of get a nice lobe in one direction when you maximize gain in that direction. And then you get these little side lobes that are inescapable part of antenna engineering. And if, if your transmission arrives in that direction, you get a pretty nice boost in signal to noise ratio, and you can decode the signal better. Uh, arrays, however, are somewhat complicated to build, however, because these phase shifters, for example, they all have to be uh, controlled by some sort of algorithm that tries to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And phase shifters tend to be bulky, expensive, lossy components in an array. Uh, and the, part of that is it's just very difficult to make a phase shifter. Phase shifter is something where you apply an electrical signal and you change the phase of the wave going through that without the amplitude. That's actually hard to do at RF because it usually involves some sort of uh, nonlinear material that has to have a response up at microwave frequencies, for example, or higher. And that's, that's challenging. At lower frequencies, you can use things like, like uh, magnetic materials to make phase shifters. Even those tend to be lossy and they're kind of clunky to work with. But a magnetic phase shifter works because if you have any material that has mu 
response, a mu sub r less than one, that's a magnetic permeability greater than one, then uh, generally speaking, those materials tend to saturate very easily. So let's say you have a chunk of permeable material that has a mu r of three. Wave goes through that. We know in this class by now that uh, the velocity of propagation of a wave is basically one over the square root of mu epsilon. So permeability contributes to the velocity of propagation of an electromagnetic wave through a medium. So this wave goes through mu sub r equal to three, and it, you know, it would basically be traveling through there at a rate that is uh, all other things being equal, one over the square root of three, smaller than, slower than the free space. There's probably some dielectric in there too, so it would be less than that even. But you know, you get this retardation of the development of the wave front through the device. And then, if you wanted to, you could put a coil around that material connected to a DC source. And what happens to most permeable materials when you start exciting them with a DC field? Well, they start to saturate. You know, you, the higher the permeability, generally speaking, the quicker they satura saturate. If you add them, uh, if you add a, impress a DC field, you'll start to saturate the current. And now the, the RF permeability no longer looks like relative three times mu naught. Maybe it's two times mu naught. Maybe it's 1.5 naught. Or maybe I've really cranked up the permeability and it almost looks like free space at RF, so that any superimposing RF field that, or an, an AC field that moves through that device experiences a, uh, a, mu a much faster propagation time because you've saturated the permeability of the material. So in that way, a DC change in the magnetic field and the permeability will lead to a change in the velocity. If nothing else changes about the geometry of the material, that means that the wave will have a different phase at one DC input than it would have if there's another DC input. If I chain, dial it up or down. And so that's a classic way to make the phase shifter. It doesn't work very well once you get to the upper UHF and beyond into the microwave regime. So magnetic materials don't work well up there. It's very hard to make a magnetic material to work at RF. So, retrodirectivity is, uh, well, this is one way to implement it. Now, nowadays, you would probably implement this type of phase shifting in a different manner. You would actually probably down convert to an intermediate frequency. Run this through a bandpass filter of some sort. And then you might run this after some amplification straight into an analog to digital converter. And you might do that for all N branches of antennas. And then you would rely on signal processing to do your arraying for you. 20 years ago, this was kind of a pipe dream for most applications, unless you had a lot of money. And nowadays, it's pretty straightforward. You put it all on a single chip. It's amazing how much things have changed. However, you'll notice that for this design, you still have to have a full complement of RF front ends for each antenna. And this is by no means a trivial chip to design. But that's basically how a phased array works, right? And it's very power hungry and it's very computation intensive. And so if I were a conventional relaying mode, a conventional transponder with a phased array, I would probably be out of bounds in terms of the type of devices that we talk about in this class, because I would just consume too much power, right? If I wanted to take a signal from location one that was being sent to me and send it back to location two, 
and receive with maximum gain in this direction, transmit in maximum gain for that direction, what would I have to do? I'd have to have all this hardware at the receiver, a similar amount of hardware for reversing the operation in transmission, and I would have to de decode the packet in this direction, re-encode it, and send it in this direction. And we're not talking about wireless without batteries. We're barely talking about wireless without a wall socket. So that's our starting point for the discussion. How, if what we would like to have is a reflective tag that receives and retransmits with maximum gain. But it has to have zero power minimal electronics small form factor and of course practically no cost so how would you do something like this well it turns out that there's a really neat concept that's been around for a long time and again, it came out of the radar community. In, uh, I think it was the 1950s, there was a researcher at Hughes Research Laboratories named Van Atta, who received a patent on a special kind of array. Nowadays, the array bears his name. It's called a Van Atta array. And he was working on radar at the time. Um, I don't know if you've ever played the flight simulator games where you drive like a, you fly a, a, a fighter to some place and you have control over the weapons and all the functions of the, the uh, aircraft fighter. Are there simulators out there nowadays? It was almost something like that when I was a kid that was pretty popular, even though computers were slow and boring back then. I'm sure they have much more advanced flight simulators nowadays that you can play with. Anyway, one of the things you can do, um, this is sort of a perennial problem in air warfare. If you have a plane that you're piloting, let's say the enemy wants to shoot you down. So they fire a missile at you. And of course, that missile is equipped with a radar. And it'll be trying to f shoot you down, follow you until he gets close, and then blow up. So what choices do you have in electronic warfare at this scenario? If you were a pilot, well, how would you try to defeat this uh, situation? You have a missile on your back. It's about to get you. You maybe only have 20 or 30 seconds before it catches up with you. What do you do? Jump out. Jump out. <laughs> That's a good answer, Dylan. That's what I would like, a parachute. That's one solution, okay. <laughs> what else can you do? Mulian, what would you do? Keeping in mind that parachutes are not 100% reliable. Uh, and you just ditched a $200 million aircraft. Uh, I, I think um, go, uh, how do you say, uh, elevate or go down. Yeah, oh, OK, to, wow. To, uh, uh, to avoid the, the rain. So, so Muliang would, uh, would maneuver. Muliang thinks he is top gun. He is a great uh, auto, he's a great pilot, so he will use his piloting skills. 
However, most of these are fairly broad beam. They would probably be able to follow you. They're lighter than you are because they're, they're less complicated than a plane, so they can keep up with you man your maneuvering. You have to be a pretty good pilot to rely on your maneuvering. Okay, Michael, you haven't, you haven't chimed in yet. Ooh, jamming. Yeah, I like that. Jamming. Spoken like a perp, true double E. This is the E double E signal. Jamming. And that's good. What are the, some of the drawbacks of jamming? I like that. Now we're thinking electronically instead of mechanically. The only problem is, uh, you know, how much power can you send with your jammer, right? What kind of signal can you send? How do you know ahead of time what the band that they're using is? And, with it, and what if the missile just homes in on your jamming signal? There's some smarts to do that in a lot of electronics, especially nowadays. So it's headed in the right direction. There's a, there's a fourth option, and you probably didn't even know about this option. But another thing that you can do is release something called chaff radar chaff. That is, dump something out the back that looks bigger than you are. But of course, it can't be bigger than you are because you are just a plane, right? You can't carry something bigger than you. But it doesn't have to be physically bigger than you. It has to be electromagnetically bigger than you. And so one way to make chaff is with this thing called the Van Atta Array. The Van Atta array is the RF equivalent of a corner reflector in optics. Remember the corner reflector? You take the edge of a cube and you kind of slice it off and you mirror the insides. And then any light that comes in, you can show will always bounce out at the exact same angle. The Van Atta array is just the RF equivalent of that. You take a linear array like this. I'll draw six elements. You can do as many elements as you want. And you connect each antenna with the exact same electromagnetic length of cable in this fashion. So one goes to six, two goes to five, three goes to four, and all of these lengths, it doesn't matter what the length is, usually the shorter the better for loss purposes, but electrically you connect them to this in the same way. And the physical effect of this is actually very interesting. What does this do? Okay. Let's say this is a linear array, so all these are resting on roughly the same plane. Let's say an electromagnetic wave arrives in a particular direction. So I'm drawing the phase front, and here these arrows represent the direction of propagation. It washes over the antenna with a certain phase taper, a linear phase taper, depending on the frequency and what direction this is arriving at. Now, if this red line that I put there, if I were to replace it with a sheet of metal, what would happen to that electromagnetic wave? It would, yeah, it would, there would be a perfect reflection, right? And what, the, what would the direction be? Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, right? According to Snell's law of reflection. So whatever angle I made with the normal, we call that theta sub i, the angle of incidence. The angle of reflection theta sub r would be identical, just mirrored on the other side. However, if these antennas absorb the wave, the wave then goes down here, travels the exact same distance, and pops up here. And 
the wave that goes into this antenna travels down here and pops up on the other side. And that happens all the way across there, such that instead of having a wave that strikes a piece of metal, and of course a piece of metal causes currents to flow, right? When, when a wave strikes a, a metal, currents set up on the surface of that metal. And what you can view the, the wave that is launched by those currents is the, the wave that's needed to satisfy the boundary conditions on that metal, to basically zero out the tangential electric field. And it turns out that how do you, if you have a wave coming down, how do you zero out the field on a, on a metal plate? Well, you have to launch a wave that ha has the exact same phase taper as the wave hitting the metal plate. The only wave that travels in this half space that meets that criterion is angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection. That's really Snell's law in a nutshell. But here we've done something different. The Van Atta array reverses the phase taper in the outgoing wave. So if we were having a phase progression like this, on my incoming wave, what does my outgoing wave look like? It has a phase taper that's exactly reversed, right? And if I have a bunch of sources with a reversed phase taper, where does that point? Where does the wave launched by those sources point? Remember, if I flipped it this way, angle of incidence would be equal to the angle of re reflection. If I flip it the other way, angle of reflection is equal to minus angle of incidence, which really, that means in the same direction. And it doesn't matter what the angle is for this structure. It also doesn't matter what frequency, as long as the antenna elements are radiating. So what that means is that this device, the Van Atta array, and there's actually a cl whole class of retrodirective elements like this, um, ways of getting retrodirectivity. So this can make a very small object look very large. Because what you can show is that if I have n elements, ideally, I now have an object that is receiving with n elements. So my gain will have a factor of n increase. And then it re-radiates with n elements so that that modulation factor or what people normally put it in is delta RCS delta sigma RCS the modulatable radar cross section of a tag for example will be proportional to n squared because you're getting gain both to and from and you're doing it without expending any power, without doing any signal processing, without having any array hardware. All you have is a dumb structure that's reflecting in the exact same direction. Okay. Now, that's all nice for radar chaff. How do you actually send information using something like this? because there's no modulated component to this, right? It's just a structure. It's a small thing you dump out the back of your aircraft and it looks like a big thing to radar. So we need to find a way to change the, to change its properties um, while still 
maintaining its retrodirectivity. So let's say we had a four element Van Atta array. What can we change about this if we wanted to modulate the radar cross section? Well, one thing we could do is put switches and break up the retrodirectivity. Not the most effective way to do things, because if you think about it, like the, the sigma RCS is a function of the angle of incidence and the angle of observation. And this retro, when it, uh, uh, a set of antennas has retrodirectivity, then that means that you've maximized this provided theta sub i is equal to theta sub r, or negative r, depending on how you define things. However, When you take the switch out, you also have a reflective structure. And who knows what the actual maximum looks like. There may be a direction, for example, off to the side where this structure here looks similar to the retrodirective structure. It's not going to have retrodirective properties at every angle, but there might be an angle where it looks, where it gives a very strong return. And therefore, if you switch between those two states, Maybe if you're looking at it dead on, you get a very big difference, a very big delta sigma RCS. If you look at it from over here, there's not that much change in the phase or the amplitude between the retrodirective structure and the static structure with the switches open. And that could result in a small delta RCS. But this is a, an interesting way to do it. One way to do this, get around this technique that authors have proposed, is to, instead of open source, uh, open circuit, it, switch in some dummy loads here so that it just absorbs any power that comes through here. So, you know, basically, if I magnify this, instead of switching open short, open short, have some sort of matched R sub L that you could switch one or both sides to to keep signals from propagating and re-radiating. So that's one technique. Another technique is to use something called a retro directive phase modulator. And some people like to put the term array, retrodirective array phase modulator, acronym of RAPM. And in this scenario, what you do is you have a system of RF switches. And say different lengths of transmission line that you can switch between. So I'm just going to show two elements without, otherwise you know how to make a, rat, a Van Atta array. You just do this like, the same way that we've talked. Take adjacent elements, the same electrical length of line, and then put the same structure in between them. So now I've got two RF switches on either side. RF switches tend to be very low power. It's so very easy to, to, draw, to throw. All you're doing is connecting RF paths. You're not actually amplifying anything or generating anything. 
And each of these has a length. Let's call this, this short length in here, let's call this theta sub naught phase change. Just a little phase change as the, the signals go back and forth through here. Then the second length is, whoop. So first length, theta sub naught. Second length is, say, theta sub naught plus pi over 2 phase change. Third phase change is theta naught plus pi, 180 degrees. And the fourth one is finally theta sub naught plus 3 pi over 2. So this device, when it sends a wave down, regardless of, of which state it's in, it's always retrodirected. The signal is always coming back in the direction of propagation with maximum gain. But the phase is changing, right? I now have, at state one, I have phase theta naught. It's 90 degrees uh, changed if I go to sp phase two, phase three, fifth, phase four, and so on. So really, what, what do I have? What do I call this kind of modulation? If I'm listening to this at a receiver, what is this called? What? What type of modulation scheme is it? Does anybody know their digital modulation scheme well? It's a quadrature phase shift keying. QPSK. Good old fashioned QPSK how all of your old router hardware works. It's the exact same signal you send for that. So this actually has a nice added benefit as well. Not only do we get n squared gain for the antenna, true n squared gain because each state in the reflective module in the reflective communication state is is retrodirective. So if I viewed the at my receiver the modulated IQ diagram, if I were just doing open short, open short load modulation on a single antenna, I'd just be getting some little thing going back and forth, back and forth between those. If I've got a retrodirective antenna that has n squared gain, I'm going to get a much bigger signal. And unlike some of the other schemes we've talked about, where maybe you only get the retrodirectivity in one of these states, and then the countervailing state is a dummy load that goes, goes to zero, that doesn't present any power back. All of your states are retrodirective. It's just that their phase change, phases are 90 degrees apart. So in communications, we have a very, what we would call a very big signal constellation coming back from this device. And you could signal from much farther away than the typical 20, 30, 40, 50 meters that uh, a simple open short little antenna gives you. It's very much analogous to communicating with uh, with light. You know, uh, if if you have a mirror and you're, you know, you you've got the sun is shining and you're trying to communicate with your buddy on another mountaintop, how do you do it? Well, you take uh, a mirror and you basically just aim it so that angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection in the direction of the where you want the signal to go. And if you were really far away, you'd be able to see that mirror flash. 
except in a way it's even stranger, right? Because really, you're the, if you are a reader and you're looking for a backscatter signal, you broadcast your signal or you scan to try to find something. And a very weak object that normally would not be able to reflect much, if it is retrodirective, it will take the signal and reflect it in the same direction without doing any fancy hardware or steering, any mechanical steering. And you'll basically see these giant flashes, essentially, from this reflective object. And there's one other interesting phenomenon to, to note about this. You know, we, we use refre reflective materials in optics all the time. Um, if you're driving down the road and you see a, a stop sign. I've done no driving in China, so you got, what are the, is it the, the triangle stop sign? What, what, what does a stop sign look like in China? I think it's a circle and then a stop, character stop. That one? No? Isn't that stop? Yes. But that's not the character you use in stop. In, in China, it's optional anyway, right? No, I'm just kidding. I've been almost killed as a, in a pedestrian crosswalk too many times here because I don't know what I'm doing. I can't read. So anyway, whatever your stop sign looks like, wherever you are in the world, some people have triangles, some people have circles, some people have oct octagons. We have octagons in, the, in North America. There's retrodirective tape that the letters in the outside are, are fitted with. And no matter which direction you illuminate from, the maximum return is always from the direction of illumination. And that's very interesting because that, that means two things. First of all, you don't have to point things. As long as your car is emitting light, you're going to see the stop sign really well. And there's another effect where if you are an observer off to the side, looking at the sign, and somebody shines the light on it, do you see the sign? So in, like anything in, in electromagnetism, there's this conservation of power at work, right? Uh, conservation of energy. If I'm doing a better job of focusing all the power back in one direction, that means I am doing a much poorer job at radiating it in the other directions. And so you can maybe try this sometime at night if you're with your, the phone on your flashlight. If you happen to be walking up close to a sign on the street side. Take your flashlight. Even your little flashlight is probably enough to illuminate the tape and the retrodirective features of a stop sign. But then get your buddy to hold it and look at it off axis. <clears throat> and you'll find that the stop sign remains dark. You can't even tell that there's light shining on it. <clears throat> what does that mean from a communications point of view? Anybody think why that might be a helpful Thing if I, if there's a sensor or an object in the field and I'm communicating with it, and I want to use backscatter. I'm illuminating something to get information out of it, and somebody that's anywhere else but me can't even see that it's there. There's a lot of applications that that would be beneficial. It really helps with the eavesdropping problem. So one other thing that I, I didn't mention, okay, I got ahead of myself here. Not only do you get, let's, let's list all the benefits here that we've talked about so far. N squared antenna gain. Uh, what we call the stop sign effect. But there's one more, at least with regards to the RAPM, and that is multiple bits per symbol.
And this buys you two things, or potentially buys you two things. You can trade them off against one another. Usually, so, so we said that the Rapam transmits QPSK. Right? You can actually make it one that does binary phase shift keying just by switching two different line lengths into the path. You could make one that switches eight different line lengths. Obviously, it gets more complicated if you want to go up to higher level phase modulation constants. But really what these, this allows you to do is it's a mechanism for transmitting more than one bit per symbol. If you define a symbol as whenever you make a switch, right? Or whenever you have the option to make a switch. Now, load modulation, if you're doing switching between two loads, that's, um, that's nice, but you can only send one bit per symbol in that scenario. So automatically, using something like a RAPM can increase the throughput of a radio link by a factor of two or three or four, depending on how complicated you want to make the hardware. And that's important for two reasons. First of all, you could just send more data in a shorter period of time. That's good. Or I could send the same data in the same period of time with longer switch times. So now I can switch at half the speed instead of how fast I would have to switch if I was just doing binary modulation. Why is that beneficial for radios that we design here in wireless without batteries class? Emphasis on the without batteries part of that. Well, here's a uh, Here is a, a hint here. When we, when, what is the thing that drives the power consumption in a radio that's using a technique outfitted with this? Remember, we got an RF switch here. We have some sort of low frequency microcontroller or computational device that's flicking things back and forth. If I can send two bits per symbol, I can now transmit the same amount of data in the same amount of time by slowing down. Now it turns out that unless you're operating at the crazy integration levels of today's microcomputers where people are trying to bring, build things at 14 nanometers and push the envelope on the size. If you're above 45 nanometers gate size on CMOS logic, when do you consume power? Well, you, you don't really consume power holding a state. If I put charge on the gate of a transistor in today's, most of today's CMOS circuits, I can keep that, that state on. And really, I, I don't need to expend any power, hardly, maintaining that state. There's a little bit of leakage, but it turns out that most of your power is consumed when you switch between states. In CMOS, silicon CMOS semiconductor. So your power consumption tends to be, in, the, in those type of circuits, when there aren't any RF components, that power consumption tends to be proportional to your frequency of clocking. So if I can do the same thing and clock half as fast, I've, I've basically uh, saved half of my battery or half of my power supply. I no longer need, I can harvest 50% of the energy that I needed to, to do communications. And this is something that we would never worry about in a conventional radio link. You say, well, how much do I, how fast should I uh, clock the baseband circuitry in this device? Well, it doesn't matter because all, all the other stuff is going to use a lot more power anyway. But when that's the only thing present, now this is the way to continually reduce your power consumption.
slow things down, transmit more bits per second. And in all fairness, this, this is not the only way to do this. Using a phase modulator with retrodirectivity is not the only way to do this. Uh, maybe if I find the paper, I'll go ahead and put it online when I get back to my office. But there's a, a colleague of not mine named Matt Reynolds and uh, his PhD student, Stuart Thomas, who's now a professor at uh, Valparaiso University. Uh, they proposed, and they actually built a chip that could load modulate with different reactive loads. And so forth. So they'd have a switch or a network of switches that could select two to the n different reactive loads, different combinations of capacitors and in and resistors. And of course if you do you know what a Smith chart is? Has everyone seen a Smith chart? Michael, do you have you seen a Smith chart before? You know, of course you have. It's undergraduate EE, right? It's the abacus of electromagnetics, the Smith chart. So a Smith chart, when a Smith chart, the center is a match. 100% reflection is on the outside. Here's zero. Here's an open circuit. And then up here on this side, half, you've got inductors, inductive loads. On the bottom half, you've got capacitive loads. It turns out capacitors are much easier to implement on a chip than inductors. And so for this reason, uh, Thomas and Reynolds idea was implemented with mostly capacitors. As a result, they have these reflect reflectors, reflective loads, that make a nice signal constellation on the bottom part of the Smith chart. So here's a four by four array of modulator points that they can select. And they're not getting any, any antenna gains. In fact, they have to kind of throw away the upper part of this inductive Smith chart to make it practical to implement. But it's a really snazzy idea. It's a really neat concept where you select different loads. And in doing so, you could dial in four bits per symbol. Because right there's, in this particular scheme I've, I've uh, illustrated, there are 16 different dots on the Smith chart that you can select. That gives you two to the fourth or four bits worth of information that you can transmit on each interval. Which means you can, s compared to a conventional load modulator, you could slow this down by a factor of four and slow down the power consumption by a factor of four as well. or slow down the energy consumption if you want to just do it in a shorter period of time. So I you know Dylan you'll be leaving quickly so I'll just wrap this up very quickly. There's one serious advantage with disadvantage with all of these techniques and that is what happens when the antenna starts to get close to objects and its impedance might change. That becomes challenging because for this quadrature amplitude modulator, this QAM modulator that I've sketched out here, that's a disaster. First of all, it's very difficult to make these loads so that they actually get on a uniform grid to begin with. If you go ahead and make this because of variations in semiconductor processes and tolerances and doping and making resistor masks and that sort of thing, you wind up getting kind of a weird, ugly constellation out of it. With a little training, you can, you can fix it, but it looks like uh, my three-year-old drew the signal constellation instead of a very rigorous engineer. And then when you, in all of this load mismatch, the shape of this constellation depends on what impedance the antenna is presenting to all these loads. If that impedance changes, then the constellation warps and bends and degrades. 
So that's one issue. And, and the Rapham, to a similar extent, can have that issue as well. If all, all, that whole system is relying on the idea that you've got antennas that present some sort of match to a transmission line that you're switching different segments in and out of. Again, if the antenna impedance changes, then you start to get mismatches at the junction. At very very least, that'll cause the size of the retrodirective constellation to shrink or increase, you know, mostly shrink. And you could get some warping too, if you get, especially if you get non-uniform changes in impedance. You put one antenna, one side of the Van Atta array next to a dielectric ob object, like, like Dylan's head, and the other one you leave in free space, then the whole thing gets messed up. There's a beautiful interplay between electromagnetics and signaling and RF hardware in designing these types of systems. So anyway, I'll put some reading online so you can read up a little bit more about these. But uh, we can call it a, a day today. <laughs>